The lesson from God's Word for our sermon on this Trinity Sunday is from the Old Testament. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 13. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and, and announces to you a sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place, and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death for inciting rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. That prophet or dreamer tried to turn you from the way the Lord your God commanded you to follow. You must purge the evil from among you. If your very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend secretly entices you saying, let us go and worship other gods, gods that neither you nor your ancestors have known, gods of the peoples around you, whether near or far, from one end of the land to the other. Do not yield to them or listen to them. Show them no pity. Do not spare them or shield them. You must certainly put them to death. Your hand must be the first in putting them to death and then the hands of all the people. Stone them to death because they tried to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Then all Israel will hear and be afraid and no one among you will do such an evil thing again. This is God's word. Dear friends in Jesus, starting today, our sermons this summer are all going to come from one book of the Bible. Deuteronomy. Have you ever heard of Deuteronomy before? Maybe you've heard the name, but it's not a part of the Bible that we spend much time in. But we're going to spend a lot of time in Deuteronomy this summer for two reasons. First of all, this summer I'm taking a, a class on the book of Deuteronomy in Hebrew. And I want to share with you what I learned. And second, how much of the Bible is God's Word? All of it. So how much of the Bible do we want to know? All of it, even some of those parts of the Bible that aren't so well known. And so this summer, we're going to spend our sermons talking about lessons from the Bible that I bet when you hear them, some of them you'll think, I don't think I've ever heard that before. Maybe like this one today. But it's God's Word. And so it's good for us to know. The book of Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament. It's the last book that Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy is a powerful call for God's people to be faithful to the one true God. And it's good for us to hear today because God has called us to faithfulness to God too. The lesson I just read, it fits perfectly with what we're talking about today. What are we talking about today? The Trinity, good. I'm glad that we got that. We're talking about the Trinity, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. And we recited together that Athanasian Creed. And did you notice how strongly the Athanasian Creed speaks? It ends with, whoever wishes to be saved must hold to this conviction of the Trinity. And maybe you'd admit with me that that just sounds out of place today. For someone to speak that firmly about something? Aren't we just bombarded with the idea that, you know what, it doesn't really matter what you believe. There's lots of different gods and they're really all about the same, right? No. Whoever wishes to be saved must hold to this conviction of the Trinity. Moses speaks just as strongly about the one true God in our lesson today. He starts by saying this, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams, appears among you and announces a sign or wonder. And, and if that sign or wonder spoken about takes place, and stop there for a second, in Moses' day, 
there were already lots of other prophets and people dreaming dreams. Now, do you remember when Moses lived? Doesn't it seem like we do this every Sunday? It does. It just keeps coming up. Moses is one of the people in my easy to remember timeline of the Old Testament. Moses was about the year 1500 BC. So Moses lived about 3,500 years ago and apparently there were already YouTubers and bloggers. 3,500 years, all sorts of people with their own ideas and thoughts. And here's what's surprising. Moses says, sometimes what they say is going to come true. Anybody can be right sometimes. And so God, through Moses, tells his people, watch out. Watch out for prophets whose message comes true. And don't you kind of say, huh? How are we supposed to do that? Well, it's by examining the message. Our lesson says, if, if that sign or wonder spoken about takes place, and the prophet says, let's follow other gods. Gods you have not known do not listen to that prophet or dreamer. See, it's not enough whether someone's message comes true. The Bible adds this. You need to examine that message and see if it points you to the one true God. Anybody can say something true. It's this message pointing me to the one true God and all false prophets, all false teaching ultimately ends up in the same place. It ultimately ends up saying, let's follow other gods. You know, the God of the Bible, it's kind of old fashioned, right? Let's move on to something new and cool and progressive and it's kind of sneaky, isn't it? False teaching's always sneaky. It's kind of tempting, isn't it? We all like new things, don't we? Moses' words make me think of some verses in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the old Apostle John, Jesus' disciple, when he was an old man, kind of like old Moses, he said, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see which are from God. John said, Christians, don't believe everything you hear. You need to test and see whether this message is really pointing you to God. The Apostle Paul he said, if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than the gospel we preach to you, we are under God's curse. The New Testament, too, has this assumption. Christians are to be people who know God's word so well, who are in God's word so often that whenever you hear a voice, a message, you're able to compare it with God's word and you're able to say, does this point me closer to my Savior Jesus? We need to do this because there's voices all around us all, all the time too. What are voices that you hear that are saying something true but in the end are saying, let's follow other gods? I thought about this for, for our own family. There's a voice that our, our family is hearing a lot lately. It's, it's the voice of youth sports. Any of you hearing that voice? The voice of youth sports says, having kids play sports is fun and it's healthy. Is that true? Absolutely. But you know, as we hear this voice, the, the voice of youth sports doesn't stop there. The voice of youth sports says, you don't need to be in church on Sundays. You need to be at tournaments and at games and at practices and then you'll have more fun and you'll be more healthy. What is that voice ultimately saying? So let's follow other gods. You hear that voice? Here's another one. It's, it's summer. And there's a voice. And it's called vacation. You hear that voice? It says, let's get away and let's just stop working and let's just relax. Is that a good thing? Absolutely. Is it that true? It's good to get away and relax. Yes, but see, see if this happens to you. I was just on vacation and I can admit this is what the voice was saying to me. It, it was saying, well, not, 
Now that you're on vacation, you don't need to read the Bible. Right? On vacation? I mean, now it's summer. You don't have to go to church in the summer, right? It's good to just take a break. Just to relax. You hear that voice? What's that voice really saying? Let's follow other gods. What voice is it for you? What voice do you hear? It's saying something true, maybe even something good, but the ultimate result is let's, let's turn away from the one true God. So listen to this. Here's what Moses told God's people 3,500 years ago. He said, The Lord your God is testing you to see whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. And when that, I read that verse, it really, it really hit home in my heart. I, I don't think about this. I should. All the time, what is God doing to you and me? He's testing us. Every decision that we have to make, every choice about where to spend our money and what to spend our time on and what to read and what to watch, every single decision is, is a test. And what's God testing? Whether we love him with all our heart and all our soul. And do I? Do you? God's testing you today. He's going to test you tomorrow. He's going to test you every day to see whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And hopefully the answer is clear to everybody, right? Hopefully everybody can see what's first in your heart and mine. Moses says, it is the Lord you are to follow and him you are to revere. Keep his commands and obey him, serve him and hold tight to him. And of course, what do we want the answer of that test to be? Who is it who's first in our hearts? It's the Lord God. Moses, to emphasize this, he piles six verbs, six actions right on top of the other. It's, it's the Lord your God you are to follow. It's him you are to revere. Keep his commands. Obey him. Serve him and hold tight to him. All to the Lord. Do you realize how important this is? Do you realize how important faithfulness to the one true God is? If we don't, this lesson certainly drives it home because did you hear what was supposed to happen to that false prophet or dreamer? Moses said that, that prophet or dreamer must be put to death for inciting rebellion against God's people. The Israelites recognized there was someone leading them away from God and they were to put that person to death. And now we've got to talk about this. Okay, you should realize that the book of Deuteronomy was God's laws for his people in the Old Testament. Unlike any nation before or after, that nation of Israel was ruled by God himself. Is that the case for us today in the United States? No. And so these laws from the book of Deuteronomy are not meant for us to put into practice today. God's not calling on you or me to put anyone to death in fact, the New Testament makes clear that as Christians, we have a different sword. Our sword isn't to kill people's bodies. What sword do we have? It's the Word of God. That's what we used to fight with. We used the Word of God. But to see what God said to his people in the Old Testament is meant to teach us something. What does somebody who commits idolatry deserve? Death. What does someone who sins against the one true God deserve? death. Of course, this is something that nobody likes to hear today. This is one of those sections of the Bible that makes people say, that is absurd. This is why we can't follow the Old Testament, right? We have moved on from that. All this death and putting people to death and come on, right? Let's just focus on Jesus. Jesus was all about love. Jesus didn't say things like this, right? Of course he did. Did, did you know that Jesus spoke more harshly than Moses did. Do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, Do not fear the one who can kill your body but cannot harm the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's what Jesus says. Jesus says, You know what? If somebody stones you to death, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about that. 
But what you should be worried about is the one who can destroy your soul and body in hell. Who's that? God. It's God. You and I are called to be faithful to the one true God. And when we're not, what do we deserve? Not just death. That's what Moses said. What did Jesus say? What do we deserve? We deserve hell. You see how important this is? Who you believe in matters. Just to drive home this message of how important this is, Moses keeps going and he uses another example. And I have to admit that, that I wish he didn't. The second paragraph of our lesson today is one of those sections that I wish wasn't in the Bible. Can I admit that? That's my sinful nature talking. But Moses goes on. He says, If your very own brother or your wife or children or your, your closest friend, now it starts to hit home, right? If that person comes to you secretly and entices Let's go and worship other gods, gods that you and your forefathers have never known. What if that that false teacher isn't just some pastor? I mean, who cares about pastors, right? What if it's somebody that we care about? What What if it's your own brother? What if it's your spouse? What if it's your child? What if it's your closest friend who's pulling you away from God? See why I say I don't I don't like to think about this. Right, family's off limits, right? Family should not come into this. And, no, God brings family into this. And Did you hear what was supposed to happen to that person? Whether it's your brother, the wife you love, your closest friend, a son or daughter. And if they come to you and say, let us go and worship other gods, God through Moses said, show them no pity. Do not spare them or shield them, they must be put to death. Your hand must be the first to put them to death. Even if it's someone whom you love, even if it's someone in our families, if, if they are encouraging idolatry against God, what do they deserve? Death. Now remember what we said before. Is God telling us to go out and put people to death? He's not. This was his law for that one society in the Old Testament. But God is teaching us something that's very important for us to know. Faithfulness to God is even more important than what? Than family. And we say, okay, the Bible can't be saying that. God can't really expect us to love him that much. Can he? Do do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, if anyone would come after me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Luke chapter 14. Sometimes in the Bible, the word hate means to love less. Seems to be the way that Jesus is using it. If we're going to follow Jesus, whom do we need to love less than Jesus? Everybody, father, mother, sons and daughters, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, even, even our own, doesn't, doesn't this challenge us? God's challenging us today. Who is first in your heart? God knows. Whom do you love with all your heart and with all your soul? God knows. And he still loves you. He still loves you so much. As as Moses encouraged God's people to be faithful to the one true God, he made sure to remind them again and again of the reason they were to be faithful to God. He repeated it a couple times in our lesson. He said something like this, The Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from that land of slavery. There was a time when those Israelites were helpless and hopeless. Where were they? Egypt. And what did God do? He saved them. I bet you know at least part of the story. 
God sent Moses, he sent 10 plagues, he parted the Red Sea, he gave them manna and quail from heaven, and God saved his people, he redeemed them from that land of slavery, and had Baal done that for those Israelites? You heard of Baal, he was one of the false gods. Had Baal done that for them? How about Molech? How about Chemosh? Who was the one who had saved them? The Lord. You see, their faithfulness to the Lord wasn't based on fear. It was based on seeing God's grace to them. There was only one God who had rescued them and redeemed them, and they were called to be faithful to this God of grace. And Do you realize that God has done the same for you and me? God has redeemed us from slavery too. And maybe you say, I've never been a slave in Egypt. Probably not. I don't know all of your histories, but I doubt it. But you've been a slave. You know that, right? Been a slave to sin. Slave to lust. Or slave to alcohol. Slave to bitterness. Slave to anger. Slave to selfishness. A slave to pride. We've all been a slave. And what did our God do for us? He redeemed us from slavery. Not with ten plagues, but with the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. We've, talk, we've heard a lot today about what sinners deserve. According to Deuteronomy 13, what does that sinner deserve? Death. And what did Jesus suffer for us? Death. He suffered our punishment to forgive us, to free us. I want you to realize that faithfulness to God isn't motivated by fear. It's motivated by God's grace. Who is like our God? You know, God has made crystal clear whom he loves with all his heart and all his soul. Do you know whom God loves with all his heart and all his soul? You. We heard Jesus' words, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We talked about how God wants us to love him more than brothers or children or spouses. And do you know what God has done for us? He sent his son for us. God loves you more than anyone, more than everything. You, you must be really special to God. He loves you with all his heart and with all his soul. And who is like our God? A couple years ago, I heard another pastor preach about the Holy Trinity, and he used an analogy I'd never heard before, and it was really helpful for me. You know, no analogy for God is, is perfect because God is so much greater than any little illustration we make about him. But this pastor, he said, the triune God, it's a little bit like how a doctor, a pharmacist, and a parent work together to save a child. Have you ever heard this before? It was new to me. He said, God the Father is like a doctor who has written out a perfect prescription for salvation. But just like any doctor, God the Father didn't actually carry out that whole plan himself. Jesus is like a pharmacist who takes that prescription and what does he do? He fills it. Jesus filled that prescription with his life and death and resurrection. He won forgiveness and eternal life for us. But you know, the pharmacist, he doesn't, he doesn't actually administer drugs to anybody, right? It's where the, the parent comes in. The Holy Spirit is like that mom or dad who takes that salvation, that medicine, and brings it home and gives it to her child. That perfect plan that God prescribed, the salvation that Jesus won, the Holy Spirit takes it and he puts it in our hearts through God's word and through the sacraments. And this is how the whole Holy Trinity together has worked to save you and me. There's, there's no one like our God. And so whenever you hear a voice that says to you, let's follow other gods, don't listen to it. It means maybe you need to change something in your life today. Maybe there's something that you need to cut out of your life. Today, it's, it's going to be worth it. Love the one who loves you. You know, you can, you can love money, but does money ever love you back? No, you can love sports. Does sports ever love you back? 
You can even love other people, and maybe it's true that sometimes they love us back, but does anybody love you back perfectly the way that you really need it? No, but, but God does. Martin Luther once said that it's worth it to lose brothers or saints or mighty people or everything just as long as you don't lose God. Isn't that true? It is the Lord your God you are to follow and him you are to revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. We are called to commitment to the one true God. Amen. Say a prayer. Dear Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have to confess that it's a little surprising for us to see the strong words in our lesson today. To your people long ago, you told them that if anyone was pulling them away from you, whether that was a false prophet or even a brother or a child, that that person who was leading people away from you deserved to be put to death. And I have to admit, Lord, that, that that surprises us. We don't take your word that seriously. We don't think about what you say as a life or death matter, but you remind us today that, that it is. That salvation is by faith in you and you alone. Dear Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, please protect us from all the voices that are trying to pull us away from you. Help us to recognize them and to avoid them. Help us, like your people needed to do, to be reminded always of your grace. Your grace in creating us and saving us and dying for us and giving us eternal life. Help us to be motivated by your grace to be faithful to you all the days of our lives. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.